breaking the wall of seeing atoms and molecules. How atomic microscopy and spectroscopy may help our understanding of materials. Daniel van Meegelberg, Universiteit Utrecht. In November 1989, I was in Utrecht. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, there is one big dream in nanoscience, and that is to relate the atomic configuration of a structure. This can be um, a molecule or a, a quantum dot to its function. And this function can be just mechanical, chemical, or auto-electrical. For this purpose, uh, scientists have tried to image atoms. And yes, there you see a picture taken in our uh, laboratory of a copper surface, and we see an ordered array of balls, and this must be the copper atoms. So finally, after 2,500 years after Democritus, we were able to see atoms on the surface of copper atoms. But is this all? Should we content ourselves just to see the atoms? I don't think so. We should inter interrogate atoms on many different ways and learn as much as possible. To explain my point, I show you this picture. We know since the, the f one of the first talks today how we can see, and this is a picture of a girl. Um, and the only thing we know is what we see, the girl. But we don't have any other information to know who she is, what she is precisely doing, and what the interaction with the environment is. So we ne need more signals to learn more about this. Um, this is the same with atoms. So we need more excitation signals to speak to atoms and see how they respond. And that will precisely what I want to show you today. We will talk about two types of things, seeing in flatland, seeing molecules and uh, atoms in two dimensions with scanning probe technology. And uh, finally, we'll end up with seeing uh, atoms in three dimensions, in three-dimensional crystals. First, start with scanning tunneling microscopy. A scanning tunneling microscope is, in fact, a very simple instrument. It's based on uh, an uh, atomic uh, ending point, a needle, uh, placed very close to a surface, and there is a bias between the needle and the surface, and uh, uh, a current, the signal will be a current, a tunneling current over the barrier, that's the green arrow, and it uh, is very distant de dependent. This basically means that the current can only flow between the last atom on the tip and the atom underneath it. So it's very sensitive, and that's why, in principle, you could get something like atomic resolution. Let's look to an important surface. This is an endophosphite surface. This is not the result of our group, but the result of a long time ago. But it's very instructive here. Uh, we look to an endophosphite semiconductor, uh, important in optoelectronic industry. And we start with uh, a potential difference of uh, 2.7 volt between the tip and the sample. And what we then see is the signal, is the tunneling current in an uh, array but that's not an atom. That's not the atoms as we have seen before. We, we see only half, we could think we see only half of, half of the atoms. On the other hand, if we change the, the bias, so the potential difference between the tip and the substrate to positive values, we suddenly see a totally different pattern. So that's the second picture, the, the white blobs in, in, a, in another direction. And if we combine them, we get something like an endophosphite surface, but we don't see atoms at all. So we have to try to understand what we are really seeing. We have to do with the signal, which is a tunnel current, and it goes from the tip to the surface or opposite. When the potential is negative, the tunneling current comes from the surface to the first atom of the tip. It means that we go from field electronic orbitals 
to empty orbitals of the tip. So what we image here are the filter orbitals of the semiconductor itself. And these are belonging to phosphor atoms. If we change the potential, then the, also the current, tunneling current is changed and uh, from direction. Now it flows from the tip to the uh, surface. And now it goes into the empty orbitals of the engine phosphide surface. And these are belonging to engine atoms. So what we in fact see are not atoms, but we see an order of electronic orbitals because of this very signal, which is a tunneling current between empty, you could almost say empty hosts and uh, or empty houses and filled houses of, of a structure. Now we go to a second example. That's an example of our group. It's a, this famous copper surface, and now we use the tip not for measuring the uh, tunneling current, but we measure the force between the last atom on the tip and the, and the surface. This is a copper surface, and we see an ordered array, and this must be the copper atoms. So what is now very different from the first case? Well, the difference is that we measure the force and not the tunneling current anymore, so we use another signal. A little secret, to make the picture sharp, we have added to our uh, copper tip. We don't use the last atom of the copper, but we use a, a carbon oxide molecule hanging bond, bonded to the last atom of the copper tip because it's a much sharper, sharper and stiffer probe. But uh, the secret of why we can see these copper atoms is not yet revealed. We Stay with atomic force microscopy and show you another example. This is an example of the, let's say, the laboratory where scanning tunneling probes were invented and where they got the Nobel, Pro Nobel Prize for. Uh, this is the group of the IBM group in Zurich. They have tried to image a small molecule. It's a uh, pentacene molecule, which is very flat, lying on the surface. Again, they have used atomic force microscopy and you see a fantastic, nice picture, that's the picture below, of the uh, electronic skeleton of the molecule, again with the same tip where the CO molecule is hanging at. Um, why can we get this type of atomic resolution? Well, the secret is more or less explained in this uh, green panel there. If you stay relatively far from the molecule with your tip. So let's say, take a typical uh, uh, example of 2.6 angstrom. One angstrom is 10 to the minus 10 meter for the public. So relatively far, but still very close. You see only the overall shape of the molecule. And the force is attractive. It's a van der Waals force between the tip end, which is the CO molecule, and the molecule on the copper surface. But if you bring the tip closer, if you start to push it close to the uh, molecule, you begin to see uh, these structures, which gets up to atomic resolution. And in this uh, region, where you really bring the CO molecule very close to your, uh, uh, to your um, uh, pentacene molecule, you begin to see repulsion, a repulsive force between the electrons in your CO molecule and uh, the uh, electrons in your pentacene molecule. So you need to go so close that you get repulsion. That's also what we finally tried to, to get in our group. Uh, we were looking to the atomic, to the limits of resolution. And we did this by trying to image one of these very small CO molecules with another CO molecule. And, uh, so come as close as possible with the CO molecule hanging on the tip to the CO molecule on the surface. And the message of that is then that uh, you can do this. And finally, when the repulsive forces get too strong, so at the best of the resolution, you really uh, start to buckle the CO molecules themselves. So this is the uh, final resolution you can get when the forces are so strong that the molecules begin to bend. And this will give the at final resolution to atomic imaging. 
Now a little bit more about three dimensions. You know that atomic atoms are also present in crystals, and we want to know how the crystals look like. We want to look inside such a crystal. For instance, you see there, an, uh, how, well, first I have to explain how we do this. We do this with uh, using directed electron beams, which are going through the crystal and making two-dimensional projections. And one of these two-dimensional projections is given there. It's like a shadow of this girl. But they just gave you a projection, so what you see is the columns of atoms. The white points are the atoms. And you cannot look inside just a, such a crystal. What we have to do to break this wall, we have to make projections in many different directions. And there's a many mathematical theorem which says if you have enough pro projections, you can reconstruct the total uh, structure, even atomic structure of your crystal. And that's what we did together with a group of Gustav van Tendelo in Antwerpen. And this is, uh, uh, this is just a movie, and I hope it works, showing you what the result is if you do this with the crystal. Now, due to all these projections and reconstruction, you begin to see the crystal, and you can look through the crystal. So finally, you get the position of all atoms also inside the crystal. You will know if there is a, a position where there is no atom. So you can look to defects, and that's precisely what you need if you want to relate the atomic configuration to the structure and function, or malfunction, sometimes, of a nanostructure. So, to end my talk, I try to convey you what scientific seeing really means. We started with a picture of a girl, and we only knew it is a girl. But by getting more information, we get a much broader view on atoms. The information was achieved by looking to electron tunneling currents. That's one way of seeing. Looking to uh, the force between the two last atoms, between a tip and a surface and uh, looking to a transmission of a, an electron beam in different projections and reconstruction, reconstruction of the uh, total atomic uh, structure of a crystal. Thank you for your attention.